The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome, everybody, to a new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Great to have you with us and terrific to welcome my co-hosts, Phil Ordway and Elliot Turner. We have a great discussion ahead. Phil, please kick us off. Thanks, John. It seems like a lifetime since we recorded two weeks ago, which was actually the fateful day that Silicon Valley Bank had its uh, fateful and fatal deposit outflow. They lost $42 billion of deposits the day we were recording. And we kind of obliquely referred to what was going on there. And, you know, one, it was stunning how quickly that all happened. And and we'll come back to that in a minute. And two, you know, unlike some of the hysterical and financially clueless and enumerate VCs on Twitter, I didn't want to be the one inciting panic and drawing attention to something where I couldn't be part of the solution. So, you know, it, so let me back up a step since we're going to talk about banks and and this whole banking crisis of 2023. Uh, by way of background and and full disclosure, so at my old firm in my prior life, when I was fresh and green out of school, I was sort of randomly assigned to cover financials, and this was in April of 2007. I was actually still in school, uh, but started working full time. So April 2007, for anyone who wasn't around or doesn't remember, was a very uh, fortuitous time, you could say, to be start covering financials as we were just sort of like the coyote running off the edge of the cliff and still running and then looking down and realized there was nothing but open air beneath our feet uh, right at the precipice of the great financial crisis. So uh, after one tiny toe in the water where I realized it was a disaster uh, from pretty much, and I'll never forget it, in July of 2007, I came in one morning, I saw Angelo Mazzillo on TV, the CEO of Countrywide, and they were touting the fact that it was a better performing stock than just about any over the past 10 years. It had outperformed Berkshire Hathaway, blah, blah, blah. So I just pulled up their second quarter results and their balance sheet and looked at it. And it was the same, you know, coyote running off the edge of the cliff feeling like there was just nothing there. So from that point forward, ended up shorting massive amounts of financials. Uh, doing really well on it, of course, in 2007 and 2008. We had a short-only fund on the back of that success. Uh, I actually did turn around and buy some distressed financials, which we'll talk about later too. That's an interesting angle to this whole thing. But I haven't shorted anything in basically 10 years. At this fund, I have no intention of ever shorting anything. Uh, Nothing that we have talked about or will talk about do I own today. Um, I used to own Schwab, so we can talk about my experiences with that, but certainly a hundred times over for the love of everything good. None of this is financial advice. You have to do your own homework. The fact that people don't do their own homework is how we get into a crisis in the first place. So, um, but as it refers to Silicon Valley bank, it is funny. So, um, even though I don't short anything anymore, a good friend of mine who is also an LP of mine and someone I want to see do well for myriad reasons, uh, does run long short. And he called me in, it was last summer, it was like August or September of 2022. And knowing my background said, Hey, have you ever looked at Silicon Valley Bank? And I said, well, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of experience with them actually, even in a prior iteration to that. Um, but I said, no, I haven't looked at it in like seven or eight years, at least uh, what's going on. And he said, Oh, I'll just go, go pull it up and have a look and, and call me back. And so I pull it up and I look, take one look at the balance sheet and literally about fell out of my chair. Like I've never seen anything quite like that in all these years. So, and it, it was a microcosm, I think, for a lot of things. So, you know, 
zooming back out to the big picture, how did we get here? And Silicon Valley stands out in a very extreme way, but it also points out some of the issues that we have, more broadly speaking. The combination of COVID and zero interest rates and massive massive liquidity injections into the economy and into the financial system couldn't have been without consequences, right? I think everyone would agree with that. And yet in the last three quarters or certainly from, you know, like April onward in 2020 and certainly through 2021, we had the mother of all speculative booms where we were just whistling past the graveyard and everything was happy and speculation was rife and SPACs were booming and all sorts of nonsense was happening and meme stocks were going bananas. And, you know, it was one of the It was a speculative orgy. There's just no other way to put it. And so I view this as a massive come down from that. And oftentimes what gets you in trouble in those types of situations isn't the problem you were looking for from last time. You know, the the old saying about fighting the last war, it's, it's what hasn't happened before, right? It's what people are failing to imagine. And so in this case, when my friend called about Silicon Valley Bank, like I just looked at the massive, massive growth and said, oh my God, like that growth like that in a bank is just always a bad thing. Like it almost never ends well. It is really, really hard to manage a bank. And when a bank is growing exponentially, it's really, really, really hard. I would say almost impossible. So I don't want to get the number exactly wrong. The the deposit book at Silicon Valley Bank went from 62 billion at the end of fiscal year 2019. So right at the beginning of COVID, right before we went into COVID, so sixty-two billion to one hundred and ninety-eight billion, just seven quarters later. I mean, it, it is absolutely unfathomable that you could grow deposits that quickly. And the problem, of course, is that they were doing that in the context of an economy that was basically closed, but an absolutely rip-roaring, booming market for all of the stuff that their clients did. So all these tech and VC companies were just waving in money. And deposits were flooding the whole system. So, I mean, look, deposits went up system wide by five or six trillion dollars over that period. But the average institution only grew its deposits by 30 or 40 percent over that two year period, which is still crazy. Like, that's still really high growth, and you're still going to see the effects of that. But they didn't see the deposit book triple in two years, which is just mind bending. And so the the problem is, what is Silicon Valley Bank going to do in that scenario? You've had a massive amount of deposits come into the system. And sure, you don't have to really pay anything for those assets, but they are a drag on on returns on capital, right? You are going to become less profitable if you don't find a way to deploy those deposits into something. And because there wasn't as much economic activity as you would expect during such a boom of liquidity and inflows. They were only able to or only chose to deploy about 15% of those deposit inflows into new loans. So what are you going to do with the other tens and tens of billions of dollars, the other 85%? They put it all into securities. So they bought a portfolio of five, six, seven year duration uh, government guaranteed mortgages, agency mortgages, and treasuries. And so, look, they did that because they didn't want to tank their earnings. They didn't want to ruin their return on capital or or diminish their return on capital. And they wanted to do it in a way that they weren't taking any credit risk. And I don't think anybody would argue that the stuff that they bought was a bad credit risk, but it was certainly disaster from a duration risk standpoint, from an interest rate risk standpoint. So, and and then we come to find out that they didn't even have a chief risk officer (laughs) during 2022, most of 2022, as is legally required. That news came out in their proxy filing on, I think, March 3rd, literally, you know, a few days before the bank actually failed, which is- Could I just add that I think Mike uh, Nongap, who we had on this podcast, has done phenomenal coverage of the lack of CRO and some of the governance angles. Yeah, I did see him write about that. that. Yeah, he, yeah, he helped sure. break that story, I think. Yeah, well, I, I saw it. I mean, I think the, the proxy, I think, was filed March 3rd. Uh, and so, I mean, it was literally like almost exactly a week before the, the bank failed. So, yeah, I mean, the, the newsworthy part was that the, the person, I guess, had been on thin ice and either resigned or had been fired and then was allowed to kind of linger for like seven or eight months, uh, partially without pay. It was very bizarre. Like, I've I've never seen anything quite like it. And look, I think the job of a chief risk officer is often kind of an oxymoron and really kind of bizarre and and associated with a lot of bureaucracy. But the fact that they did this and the fact that they just kind of snubbed their nose at it is not a good thing. Look, I just, 
pulled up their board of directors, I didn't count one single person that I would consider to be a banker on the board of directors. There's like five VCs. There's a guy who runs a vineyard. There's somebody who used to be the deputy assistant to the regional manager, undersecretary for treasury, whatever. But there wasn't one single person on the board who was actually a banker. So look, this is one of the titles that I was going to give to this little rant and talk. And I I stole this phrase from somebody that I read about, uh, you know, is it somebody else's blog post or Twitter rant or something was, it was this crisis a bank run by idiots or a bank run by idiots? So one of my favorite books, books Eat, Shoots, and Leaves, uh, a play on grammar and how much punctuation and grammar and spelling matters. Like, like, is there a hyphen between bank and run or not? Because was this a bank run by incompetent people or was this a run on the bank by idiots, right? So you get the, the yes. play on words. There. and yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and, and that is it, right? I mean, that is the problem is that it was actually a double-edged problem, right? And so as soon as, for whatever reason, the bank decided in the middle of March here to announce that they were taking the hit and selling some of, the, basically all of their available for sale portfolio and realizing about a 10% loss on that portfolio to raise liquidity to meet what had been a kind of steady trickle of deposits going out, which I would associate entirely with the fact that almost all of their clientele is net cash flow negative and needs that money and is dependent on new VC inflows. And some of those clients were probably going to fail as the you know tech boom kind of fizzled out and the VC funding slowed down. So they were, they were, you know, for sure, deposits had been declining in prior quarters, but it had been manageable up to that point. And management then decided, well, let's sell the available for sale book to raise liquidity. And in doing so, we're going to have to take this loss and we're going to have to raise more capital. So they raised, they announced the capital raise on Wednesday night, the Wednesday night before we recorded. So that would have been what, March 9th. And then didn't price the equity offering overnight. Like that's what's so stunning. So we wake up on Thursday and all day through Thursday, the stock's open, it's getting destroyed. The venture capital community is absolutely panicking and in a way that still defies belief and credibility was saying all sorts of crazy things that just weren't true. But at the end of it, none of it really mattered because they were the ones who put all these companies into business. They were the ones who should have been controlling the purse strings. And when they all realized that they completely and utterly failed to do any due diligence on their only counterparty, they all panicked at the same time and said, everybody run. So, you know, something like 30% or 40% of the entire deposit base came flying out in one day. And at one point you couldn't get through, the customer service systems were failing, there was multi-hour delays to even get a wire out, like it was a total fiasco. And it was total, it was game over. So everything from that point on, like it, it's all kind of a moot point at that at that juncture and, and here we are. So I don't want to go on too much more of a rant because there's a lot to talk about, but the things that we can discuss, and I'll take this wherever you guys want to go, is... The other banks that were affected, Signature Bank then obviously failed a few days later for kind of related reasons, but not entirely. First Republic's been in the news a lot because they required basically an injection of deposits from uh, a consortium of 11 other banks. Uh, it's still unresolved as of this recording. This is March 23rd uh, that we're recording this. We can talk about the other regional banks that are out there that are potentially subject to some of this contagion. We can talk about the big systemically important money center banks and their role in this whole thing. We can talk about Charles Schwab, which is a really fascinating case. We can talk about the role of the FDIC and and CIPIC and the difference between deposit insurance and the securities and in, in insurance protections that you have if you have securities in a brokerage account. Uh, we can talk about the regulatory response and probably what should happen and what is likely to happen. So there's, it's just a multi, multi-faceted mess. It sure is. And, you know, I think you made a lot of good uh, points and set the stage for like multiple lines of attack. I love that line bank run uh, by idiots because, you know, I, in preparing for this podcast was going back to a story from the wall street journal yesterday how the last ditch effort to save Silicon Valley Bank failed. And there's this little part about how they basically on Thursday had an opportunity to transfer assets to the Fed and uh, get some liquidity in exchange. And they missed their freaking deadline 
to do as much with Bank of, BNY Mellon and get it done. And it's like all they had to do was get that done by 4 p.m. Pacific time, and they probably would not have perished that day and could have done, who knows, their fate might have been sealed by then, but at least, you know, could have at least made it to the weekend and try to figure something else out. And, um, you know, that's just wild to me. It's wild that the FDIC came in during market hours without waiting for the weekend. These things typically get resolved over the weekend, if I recall. I don't remember even in the crisis, any of these happening in the middle of of, a regular business day. No. Um, Apparently, they literally couldn't open on Friday morning. Like they were insolvent and illiquid. And yeah, that. And and so, look, it's an interesting question. Like the regulators had actually been in here, right? They had issued six warnings and citations going all the way back to like the onset of COVID and pre COVID. Like the internal controls were cited for weaknesses. Like there were lots and lots of issues here. So the regulators were actually, you know, kind of waiting and watching. Now we can have a whole separate argument about when they should have tried to crack down and stop this. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it's totally stunning. Like I, I, I remember saying to somebody Thursday night, I don't know if Silicon Valley is going to make it through the weekend. Like they're probably going to get closed on Sunday. And then when it happened on Friday, they didn't make it to the weekend. Yeah, it was, it was stunning. It really was. And, um, you know, when you think about like signature bank, uh, in the wake of this ending up with a similar fate, um, it's it's kind of a mess, and it's got some contagion throughout financial markets. Although markets have handled this a little better than we thought, and I guess one of the questions I'd have is: Would Credit Suisse have ended up with the same fate had Silicon Valley Bank not failed? Now there were plenty of problems, problems galore right. in Credit Suisse, but right. it just kind of raised issues about anywhere there might be issues. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I think the way to look at this is, you know just the way a recession comes along and wipes out a lot of weak companies that you knew weren't going to make it at some point. It was just a question of when. And 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 that was my response to, to my friend last year was like, look, Silicon Valley obviously has problems here. And it was Silicon Valley Bank, you know, looking back seven or eight months ago. And, and But this is why like shorting is so difficult because who in their right mind would have guessed that this thing would end in the course of like a couple of days in the mother of all deposit panics. Right. I mean, I think every reasonable short seller, even back in January or February, would have said like, "Okay, they screwed this up really badly. They're going to have to fix it. And that's likely going to involve a very painful dilutive capital raise. And the stock was trading at what, you know, six hundred dollars a share at one point, you know, it's trading several multiples of tangible book and very expensive on an earnings basis. So you had the the cushion there from the short seller's perspective to to take that on and 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 wait it out. But like, I don't think anybody expected this to go from zero to a million miles an hour because every VC in California got on Slack and started freaking out and, you know, sunk the ship in a matter of a few hours on a Thursday afternoon in March. Like that, that the is day the after they announced a capital raise, sunny. which could have solved the problem, but then well, they had a yeah. disastrous conference call saying the only well, thing that could get us in trouble is if everyone leaves us all, all at once. Exactly, People are like, oh right. God, wait, I yeah. should leave before everyone else does. Right. I mean, they, the, the the way management handled this, both by announcing the loss in conjunction with the capital raise and then not pricing the capital raise is just unfathomable. Like I and look, I know Goldman was in there. Goldman was buying the available for sale book. They were also the advisors. I, I, I've asked some friends that have actually worked there and I'm like, have you ever seen a situation where there's any whiff of trouble and distress and you announce a capital raise uh, overnight midweek and then you don't actually price it overnight? Like, especially when you had a couple of anchor investors, now Warburg backed out, right? They were supposed to be half of the, the private MGA part was there. And, they were a big and General chunk of Atlantic it. stuck around. I mean, I would assume they had a contingency on the public piece getting done and they never actually put that money in, but who knows? I mean, there were people... You know, I remember TPG putting money into banks right on the way down, you know, back in the financial crisis. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of people that are trying to catch that falling knife. And sometimes it just goes really, really poorly. And I mean, the other thing about this that's truly stunning. Let me see if it I don't think it's I actually haven't looked in a couple of days. But yeah, I mean, so Silicon Valley Bank, when it was halted on Thursday, was trading at a hundred and six dollars and four cents per share. And <laughs> It's obviously worth zero now. Um, you know, I don't even think the meme stock cords on Reddit can save this one. But like, uh, 
This was trading at almost $300 a share at the beginning of March, $288 at the end of February. And to go from 288 to 106 in the matter of a few days and then to be halted and go to zero is just absolutely stunning, right? I mean, you just don't... I. I, I can't remember. I'll have to. I wonder if anyone. Yeah, not even during the financial crisis do I remember. No, 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 no. No one went like from this. triple digits. Well, you didn't have that many triple digit stock prices to begin with. But, you know, I remember when Bear Stearns was trading and it went way, way down. And that was definitely in the triple digits before it got into trouble. And, you know, it, it was gapping down by five or ten dollars per day and whatnot. And then they announced the sale price of two dollars and which ultimately got revised to ten dollars a share. But like the two dollars was so shocking. But this is way more shocking, like to be at $106 and be halted. And then the funny thing is like, it's a bit of a process to transfer this and relist it on the queue and the queues over the counter because like there's lots of regs and rules you got to follow here. And like they didn't even file for bankruptcy for like a full another week, the holding company, I mean. And so it still hasn't opened. You know, the thought that I've heard is that they're going to hopefully reopen it before too long because you get to the end of the month and the end of the quarter and anybody who was short this thing is just sitting here with like this illiquid thing that's now turned into kind of a level three nightmare. They'll be able to recognize the P&L, but, and, and thankfully it wasn't a negative rebate situation. I was talking about this with some other folks. If you remember the whole Chinese reverse takeover fraud boom and bust uh, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago now, where a bunch of those things just sort of disappeared overnight and got delisted. Uh, but they, you know, st- they had big short interest in them at the time. And like all those shorts were on the hook for a significant negative rebate for like months and months and months while that got worked out. It was a real mess. I think. Yeah, you, I, I think a lot of people thought the FDIC would have uh, gotten at least big chunks of this sold by now to approach some kind of reopening, I guess. Well, that, the reopening is separate, right? Because the exchange is a separate set of rules and and it has to abide by them. By So, I mean, the, the holding company is separate from the bank that was seized and closed, right? It was obviously the primary asset of the holding company, but not the only one. And so the fact that they're no longer current on their financials, the fact that there's, you know, all this news out there that's very material that hasn't been fully disclosed because frankly, no one knows what's happening. It's just really, truly bizarre. So like SIVB Common will never reopen it, certainly at that price either. It'll be transferred and ultimately listed over the counter. And and the short interest was relatively modest in the grand scheme of things. I think it was like five or 6% short interest when it filed, but just truly stunning. And and Signature Bank was pretty close, right? I mean, even though that failed afterward, that was at $70 a share, seven zero, like just mind boggling that these things just disappeared so quickly. And it just shows you, and that look again there, I mean, a year ago, SBNY was over $300 a share. And at the beginning of March, it was about $125 a share, like just stunning, right? The, so the I want to visit quickly. one big part of the narrative with Silicon Valley, because I think it's, it is something important and sets the stage for some of the other bank situations too. You know, there's this, um, line of thinking that that's spreading around suggesting that Silicon Valley Bank went under because they made really bad loans to um the venture world right through and, and that's through not true whether it be to the people involved to the companies etc it is absolutely untrue right they went right. under because they didn't manage uh, the the duration of their assets and their deposit base relative to right. that it, right. it was well, they, just yeah. the ultimate duration mismatch. And I think, you know, you could add to that um, that they they had a problem and they made a, a very specific choice. And that problem was, Phil, you set the stage nicely. They had a massive influx in deposits. And so what happens with that is if you can't invest fast enough on the asset side, you're going to face considerable pressure on earnings. And Silicon Valley Bank, being a formerly premier franchise, was valued far more on their earnings than they were on book value, unlike other banks, right? Most book, most banks trade at some, you know, relative level to book value, where it's like you divide ROE by their cost of capital, and that's a multiple of book you should have. But Silicon Valley Bank was just like an earnings driven franchise. And so they traded at a considerable premium to book value and they knew this. I can't find the exact source, but there's some liter- something out there where 
management actually did say, hey, we could in, we could keep these deposits in very short-term treasury notes, but that sure. would really hurt our EPS. And therefore, we're going to extend the duration. And right. that will protect our EPS and therefore defend our stock valuation. That was the choice they made. Right. Um, and it wasn't a and and they thought they were doing something safe and buying treasuries. And the other side that they didn't appreciate that that I, you know, really uh it it really hit me over the head in the last week is and not not the last day, I guess a week and a half ago, heading into the the final days, was that their deposit base was effectively a really, really um small group of people who controlled the mandate behind yep. it. Um right. it was not even even you know, let's say you had a hundred accounts. It was really five people making the decisions, right? It wasn't like a hundred independent accounts. So well, not I would only argue once, it, I would argue once one of them yelled fire in the crowded theater, that was all it took, right? Literally one 100%. Peter Thiel, literally one Peter Thiel getting on Twitter and saying everybody run was more than enough. Yeah, it's a it, it's one of the most herd like groups there yeah, is. It really is, and they, so, they had no idea that. Like the fascinating part is, and I'm, I'm gonna strongly resist the urge to name names, but there were several prominent venture capitalists that were crying in public <laughs> on terms that were not only hypocritical, but were just factually wrong, like financially incapable people and totally innumerate in the arguments they were making. And that was to me right up there is probably the most eye-opening part of this whole thing was that these venture capitalists had no idea what they were talking about. And yet, because they'd been so successful and because they had made so much money and controlled so many powerful companies and had so many resources at their disposal that they just assumed that the world would work one way when they were completely and totally dead wrong about it. And then when they were proven wrong, they just said, well, now we have to you know, fix that to our liking. Like It was truly staggering. So let, let's talk about this, Phil. I want to ask you, what do you think of the policy response and what do you think the appropriate policy, policy response yeah, should so that's, be, or should have been here? That's one thing. Well, uh, look, I'll say this. I, I'm i not going to defend regulators, rating agencies, crossing guards in general, because I think they don't often focus on the right things. But then you have to ask yourself, why is that? And it generally boils down to what their incentives are, right? If, if you are a regulator, your incentives are such that you're often not rewarded for looking ahead. You're often rewarded for looking backward and solving what has just happened rather than solving what problem could be just around the corner. So I am not especially critical of the regulators in this case because, you know, I don't think obviously it would have behooved them to come in here with a sledgehammer and really cleaned this up before it got out of control. But that moment kind of passed in 2020. Right. Because had they come in here more aggressively in 2021 or early 2022, as this problem was really peaking. And just to be clear, the the held to maturity, the unrealized losses in the book, both at Silicon Valley and across the entire industry, actually peaked in the third quarter of 2022, like a full six months before this crisis came to a head in the in the markets and in the real world. So if they had come in with a sledgehammer earlier than that and been kind of the proximate cause of someone going under, they would have caught, holy hell, people would have been completely upset and livid that, you know, they not only took away the punch bowl, but that they ruined some supposedly good businesses, right? So I, they're really damned if they do, damned if they don't in a lot of ways. It's it's also, like I said, it's somewhat like what I've argued about the the issues around regulating crypto was that the rules and regulations and the laws and Everything that's been set up by Congress weren't designed for a world of crypto and they weren't designed for a world of zero interest rates. And so again, without zero interest rates and, and negative rates in a lot of the world, and certainly negative real rates, and without something like COVID, none of this would have happened. So, and, and no two banking crises, uh, crises are exactly alike. I mean, this most closely resembles the SNL crisis, but that had a huge you know, credit issue on the books, right? Like, well, a there lot was of two phases, right? Loans. This is like the early days of the SNL crisis. And I say this as yeah. someone who's just read about it for the last week, not with deep no, knowledge and, and about it. it. It certainly could. I've gotten that question a lot too, is like, won't this create kind of a circular reference to create credit problems? And look, it certainly could. I, I wouldn't rule that out. But like, as of right now, the issue just was that you had a massive influx of deposits and banks exist 
really their their primary function is to transform those deposits, right? Is to manage that inherent asset liability mismatch, the duration duration mismatch. Like that exists in the world and somebody's got to management manage it. And that's why the banks exist. That is the sole purpose of a banker is to manage that. And in this case, Silicon Valley just did a very, very bad job of it. They were unwilling, as you said, the incentives made them unwilling to take the near-term earnings pain to protect the long-term franchise. And everything about how the company was set up and how it was culturally operating and everything about it just utterly failed in that regard. So what do you do from a regulatory perspective about that? I'm not sure there's much you can do, right? I mean, you've had... Well, should runs. deposits be protected? Yeah, so I'll get to that. I mean, but you've you've had bank runs and you've had herd mentality and you've had panic since the beginning of time. So how do you get around that? I don't think you really do. So the question becomes, how do you mitigate the damage to that? I would argue that the FDIC and the deposit insurance program that was instituted during and after the Great Depression is one of the most successful regulatory regimes in the history of man. Uh, it's, you know, the costs borne by the public are de minimis because, yes, it does potentially fractionally raise the cost of capital, but at the same time, it greatly reduces the risk to the system, which you could argue more than offsets that and probably lowers the cost of capital for everyone involved. And the deposit fund itself has it never had to go to the public for any, any direct money. It covers its own expenses, so to speak. So I would argue that that's worked very, very well. So the deposit insurance cap was raised to $100,000 in 1980. It was raised to $250,000 in 2008 coincident with the financial crisis and it's been at 250 ever since um look is it time to raise it to 500 or even a million sure i would be sympathetic to that argument but if you raise it to a blanket deposit explicitly i think you bring in the risk of a lot more harm than good i don't know that that's a route you really want to go down i think you're going to basically be taking a risk taking enterprise in the private markets and transforming it into a nationalized or a shadow nationalized banking system that doesn't resemble anything like a free market. And look, the the funny thing is, right? I mean, you've actually had a implicit guarantee of all deposits, both insured and uninsured, ever since IndyMac failed back in the in the financial crisis more than fifteen years ago. And in this case, you know. Largely, I actually don't think the the whining of the venture capitalists on Twitter had much to do with it. I think that was just sort of the reflexive result of of the accumulated pain and suffering of the regulators. They they did step in and explicitly guarantee and backstop all of the uninsured deposits at Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. And I would not at all be surprised if this continues to spiral a little bit with a few more banks, or if the uncertainty and volatility lingers. That you see a six month or twelve month or two month continuation of that backstop. But I do not think it's a good idea to continue doing that in unlimited size at every bank for multiple reasons. I mean, number one is look, you need to, you need to, you need to ensure that the economy continues to function and that depositors have access to their capital. And so if you had $250,000 now in Silicon Valley bank, and you only had one bank because you're a small, sweet, innocent little app company that just started up with money from Kleiner Perkins, and you've got five hardworking hipsters cranking away in the back room, you can make payroll next week with $250,000. Like That's not a problem. So I don't understand the issue here. And if you're some big, strong company with $10 million on deposit, and you've got a big six or seven figure payroll, like then it's time to hire a real CFO and a real treasurer and somebody with some big boy pants who can figure out how to use a money market fund or some T-bills to manage the risk of meeting payroll, right? Like I truly have no sympathy for that. And for all these supposedly operationally brilliant VCs and private equity firms that are out there who are wiring millions and millions and millions of dollars to these companies and then just letting them ignore basic financial management 101 like i have absolutely no patience for that and i don't think there's any place to any argument to step in and say like we need to backstop this and we need to guarantee it at the government level like that is completely and totally insane because look anytime a business is this concentrated and subject to this much fickle behavior all of your liquidity is subject to going out the door like all of it very quickly there's no escaping that so i don't think you're going to be able to to get away from that the other thing that I'll say from the regulatory perspective is that 
one result of this that I hope will come and I think might come, although I wouldn't place a ton of confidence in that, is that we have to get away from risk weighting assets, right? I mean, that was one reason, that was one big incentive that drove people like Silicon Valley Bank to do this. Because look, let's be honest, they have made a horrible, horrible mistake and management should be, you know, held accountable for that. But they didn't wake up one morning and think like, you know, how can we throw caution to the wind and completely ruin ourselves in a short period of time? Like, at least I don't think that's what happened. But the reason they ended up doing this, to your point earlier, Ali, it was like, these were good assets. These are agency mortgages, right? And, and government securities. And the reason they did it was the risk weighting is really, really low. You've got to get away from that. We have to go to a simple, tangible common equity test, a leverage ratio test that just says an asset is an asset is an asset, and it has to be funded by a liability. And if your liabilities can all go out the door and it does, I mean, you, you can just find so many ways to get in trouble on the asset side. So what difference does it make? I mean, this, this is somewhat related actually to the AAA mortgage and RMBS fiasco of the last crisis, right? I mean, this one just rhymes a little different. It turns out that those were rated AAA and were actually total garbage. It turns out these securities were AAA and they're money good. It's just you had too much of a good thing, right? You overdosed on these supposedly safe securities. And the only way to get away from that and get around that is to go to is to completely get away with risk weighting of assets, which again never used to be a thing, right? That that's a somewhat novel concept in the you know generational landscape of bank regulatory regimes. So got to get away from that. Um, and the only other thing I would say is like these 10B51 plans have got to go. They're just being completely and totally abused. They're a total joke. The executives at Silicon Valley Bank were all dumping stock like days before the company went under. And it was all on the basis of these 10B51 plans that can be, you know, set in place like years prior and then amended and made effective in a matter of days, despite having, you know, knowledge of what's going on behind the scenes that's very much material and non-public. And it's just a regulatory loophole that is total garbage. So those are the things that I hope happen. I hope we don't have a blanket guarantee of all deposits. I hope we go away from risk weighting of assets. Uh, and I hope the 10B51 plans go in the garbage. I'm, I maybe have a slightly different perspective on the deposits. I feel like those should be guaranteed where it's very hard to make the proper determination on a bank's uh, creditworthiness for the average depositor. Uh, I know in Silicon Valley Bank's case, there's far less sympathy owed to their typical depositor. But in general, system wide, you know, for the average person, there's not really the opportunity to think about it and, you know, at what level you are or are not covered. Well, but, let, but let me ask you this if you're an average person, right, you don't have a million dollars on deposit, right? Nope. That's. So, if, you know. and this goes back to the widows and orphans protections and private securities offerings. And so if you're a big boy and you're rich and sophisticated and you can think for yourself, you need to think, boy, I've got my money in a bank that is a little wild and crazy or, you know, even I guess if I've my never- thoughts more covered with what you said about raising the FDIC limit, though. I do think 250 might be cutting it a little too close for uh, where the, you know, inflation adjusted numbers are from- Sure. Having gone to a hundred thousand in nineteen eighty, two fifty in yeah. Which again, I'm sympathetic. Like, I'm sympathetic I, okay, to so that. Maybe but maybe that's that, probably more where I'm thinking about it. As that well. wasn't the problem though, because like you know, again, like you could, with a married couple, you can go to five hundred thousand, and you're already in the top tiny little fraction of the world's population and the American population in terms of in terms of your wealth. If you have that much in cash on deposit at one institution and, you know, if it's really that much of an issue and you open a couple of accounts at a couple of different banks, right? Like it doesn't have to get that crazy. And again, like all you have to do is put it into some other asset class that is absolutely money good and probably earning more cash. And we're going to come <laughs> back to the yes. or, or earning more interest on your cash. And we'll come back to that effect uh, on bank balance sheets and income statements. I really want to talk about the risk weighted asset thing, too, because to that point, um, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, if their deposit base were not fragile, they theoretically, and this is probably part of your argument for not wanting to guarantee deposits, they could have burned off the held to maturity losses just via lower earnings until right. there was a convergence between the market value and the principal value of the treasuries, right? The risk-free right. asset in our economy. Right. So theoretically, if if they had no risk to their deposit flight, um, 
the only consequence would have been what they were trying to avoid by investing in those treasuries in the first place. Very right. low earnings for a period of time. Um, and one of the, I guess, reflexive uh, outcomes of this whole situation is that treasuries have gone up a lot. And so some of these held to maturity markdowns that people are talking about at the end of Q4 have reversed mightily ever since the fissures emerged in, uh, call it confidence um, at our in our banking system. So I think that's an interesting thing to think about. Do you think if uh, do you, should we be worried about held to maturity markdowns on like super safe assets? Well, yeah, just because like it's not normal to have interest rates at zero, and it's certainly not inter- normal to have interest rates go from zero to five percent, roughly in fifteen months, right? So like that's gonna create some earthquakes, and this is one of the results that you're seeing. This is an earthquake that's being caused by that giant jump. So, you know, there are lots and lots of banks that put money to work at, in five and 10 year duration assets at one and a half percent that are now way underwater on that. So if you look across the whole industry, like if you look at all US banks, you have about 2.2 trillion roughly of equity capital and the unrealized mark, the unrealized loss and all of the held maturity portfolios combined is like 675 billion. Right. So like a quarter of the equity capital of the U.S. banking system is currently, if you had to, you know, liquidate the entire industry today, would be vaporized. And that's not a good thing. Now, the good news is if interest rates have peaked and if the stupid decision making has stopped, which it probably did several months ago or even several quarters ago, it probably doesn't get much worse than this. And then if you get a credit cycle on top of it, you still have enough capital, like because we started from a higher capital base, relatively speaking, than in many prior cycles, you have enough capital to absorb this on a on an industry wide basis. Right. Whereas like in 2007, 2008 and even in the SNL crisis, when hundreds of banks failed, you're looking around like, wow, there are a lot of banks that are not going to survive this in this case in kind of the some of the worst case scenarios you look at some of the banks that are that are way underwater on their held to maturity portfolios and you say yeah uh, some of these banks might not make it and all it's going to take is either a credit cycle or a run on deposits and there's no way for them to stop it but at an industry level like not a huge problem but yeah look it it is a problem and the way to think about it now is like all right let's say we reset the clock from today the fed just raised 25 basis points yesterday but like hopefully it's not going to be another shock on top of a shock in terms of like a further spike in interest rates from here. So if you think this approximates like the starting line, like all you have to do as an industry is just continue to earn your way out of this hole for the next few years. Yes. Right. Because that, that will happen. Like that's just the math of it. Right. There's the the entire industry is not going to liquidate this portfolio or transfer this portfolio to available for sale and take the hit. So like they just have to earn their way out of the hole and, and, keep on keeping on, right? That's Well, so there's an embedded answer in there to the question I was going to ask, but perhaps I'll ask it anyway. Would you, as Regulator King, be tapping some banks on the shoulder and saying, hey, raise capital now? Well, they do, right? I mean, the problem is you can't change the rules mid-game and say like, you know, we gave you this choice to designate things held to maturity, and that was all good when you guys had unrealized gains, but now that you have unrealized losses... You know that huh. that doesn't work anymore, right? So that's that's kind of the problem. But yeah, look, the, what what they will do is just say, you know, we're watching you, we're we're looking at you, we need you to be proactive about this. You know, if you get into trouble on the deposit side, you just saw how quickly we acted with Silicon Valley Bank. Like, we're not going to be overly patient here, and that will push some companies either into mergers. Like one of my, I have a list of seven or eight things here on my likely outcomes, and and one of those things is that. Uh, whether by hook or by crook, you're going to see a little more M and A. I think over the next, you know, six, twelve, eighteen months, right? Because a few of these weaker banks are just going to wave the white flag and and merge into a position of safety because they're they're feeling a little bit vulnerable. But yeah, it's tough, right? I mean, the regulators can't come in and say, "All right, yeah, like you're you're solvent today, or you're you're borderline solvent today, but you're plenty liquid today. So we need you to raise more capital because that's, that's, you know, that's why these banking rules and regulations are stipulated in thousand page documents, right? So they can't just say, oh, well, you have the ability to handle this unrealized loss in your five-year duration agency mortgage book, but yeah, we're a little nervous about it. So we're just going to kind of change things up and make you raise equity now. Like they, they don't really have the power to do that. 
Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And it's um, interesting to see you, you you mentioned the merger angle, but like the reaction in the stock market for NYCB when they bought the signature assets, it, it was like mm. a real vote of confidence in at least that one bank by Mr. Market, yeah. if only for a day. But yeah, I find such things I mean, notable. It does give a little more cover for some banks on the acquiring side to start thinking about uh, what they can or can't do. There's some well-capitalized right. banks who quite candidly spoke about not doing what Silicon Valley Bank did and were sitting on some shorter duration securities who could actually, you know, maybe solve some of their own earnings, uh, their their own under earnings problem that's been hitting them for the last couple of years. Right. I wanted to ask an investor question for you, speaking of investor things, right? Um, you know, you said about regulators always fighting the last war. Do you think to a degree investors are fighting the last war here, invoking 08 and talking about yeah. this as if it were like... Yeah. For the sure. redux of the last decade's problems. Talk yeah, about that sure. a little bit. Yeah, because it doesn't, I mean, it, they're two totally different problems. I mean, back then you had banks with very little capital taking very stupid credit risks. And in this case, you have banks with plenty of capital taking very good credit risks, right? So like the, the problems that led us here are not the same, right? The problem here was that you had banks completely ignoring the riskiness of their deposit base and the the riskiness of the duration embedded in their investment books. And, and I, I guess if there's any commonality between the two, it's that most banking crises are a misappropriation of correlations, right? So like everybody assumes like, oh, I'm diversified enough and my correlation over here is X and my correlation over here is Y. And when I multiply them together, it's no problem. And it's like, nope, when it all hits the fan, correlations go to one. And that's been true since the beginning of time and it will continue to be true. And you have to plan for those days when like crazy, stupid stuff happens and some idiots get on Twitter and Slack and start a run in your deposits and there's just not a damn thing you can do about it. And you just can't put yourself in that position, right? So like that, that is the commonality. But other than that, like I said, I mean, the, the big picture writ large in, in 2007 was that like, I remember coming home various days. It was a little bit later in 2008 and, and telling my wife, like, I don't know if our ATM card is going to work the next day because the whole system could just completely go under. And we may legitimately have to nationalize like the big banks and and do some sort of like crazy, unheard of, uncontemplated stuff to just keep the economy going. In this case, this is a very, quote, normal banking crisis, right? Like some banks got over their skis and got overextended and it sucks for them and there's real consequences for real people i'm not trying to make light of it but it is by no means like a issue across the entire sector like i said when you look at the industry wide balance sheets and you look at the balance sheets of the big guys right like look i mean there there are some banks like if you take the top 6 or 8 us banks by assets there are some that are stronger than others but as a group like they're rock solid and they will be the big winners from this whole thing right they will continue to attract, like, if you're wiring money out of Silicon Valley Bank last week, like, where were you probably sending it, right? Not to some little bank that nobody's heard of. Is that a problem, of. right? Like, one of the unique things about the American banking system is we have all these regional banks. If you look yeah. at Europe, there's like one or two national champions yeah. in any country. Um, do, you, do you view that as a problem? Because that seems like the most clear conclusion of this all is that the big banks just got a whole lot stronger. Yeah, they did. They got... I wouldn't say a whole lot. I would say a little bit because if you add up all of this, like Silicon Valley Bank, I think was the 16th biggest bank by assets in the US when it failed. And if you take all of their deposits and send them all to JP Morgan, not a huge deal, right? And like they didn't really all go to JP Morgan. They went to JP Morgan and plenty of others at the same time, right? So like, and it, it seems true of Signature and anyone else. So, but look, I mean, we had 8,000 banks when I was born, we're down to like half that now, I think a little less. I mean, did we ever need 8,000 banks? I mean, the, really the only reason we had 8,000 banks was back in the day when the U.S. was like a super agricultural agrarian economy. Every little town with more than 100 people and it had its own bank, right? And over the years they grew up and every little town had its own little bank that was still there when there was no reason for it. So I, look, I, I'm always wary of over-concentration and oligopolies that get screwed up. I don't think I'd necessarily want a world where literally 100% of bank assets and deposits were held by three or four banks, but we are worlds away from that. And by the way, there are some economies very similar to ours in style and structure that have managed to be just as well, or I should say 
you know, it's been kind of mediocre, but like you can't say we've done it perfectly and they haven't done it any worse, right? Like Canada, Australia have very, very concentrated banks, banking markets. Western Europe does too. Like I, it's going to take years and years, my entire lifetime to get there. And I don't think it's the end of the world by any stretch. So to burn off some of this equity cushion problem, right? Part of what's going to happen is these regional banks are going to pull back from lending and they're pretty critical lenders to real estate and small business in particular. Mm. Do you worry about that? Do you think private sure. capital could step in at least for some of that? Like, how do you think that plays out? Does this have macro consequences? I've seen references oh, yeah. to this is the equivalent of like a 75 to 150 bit tightening by the Fed in some ways. Yeah, yeah, I've seen those. I don't know how you ever calculate a number like <laughs> right. that. But but yeah, look, directionally... Finger and win, pick a number. Yeah, sort of. exactly. Right. I mean, directionally, it's 100% correct, right? Like, they would never say this, but on the one hand, the Fed's like thrilled because this is taking air out of the balloon, right? So in, in that sense, yeah, it's it's Powell good. Powell kind of said that without saying it, that's for sure. Yeah, right. But he's not going to be totally explicit about it. But yeah, look, I mean, there are macro consequences for sure. And the only part where it gets really bad and painful for like the average person or the economy writ large is that, you know, if this creates its own credit cycle and then really, really feeds on itself, right? So if that loan book that looks okay today, and we didn't really come back to that on Silicon Valley Bank, although it is a, an interesting part of the puzzle, but if the loan book today that also includes uh, some commercial real estate loans that also have, you know, like a office occupancy problem, if those now go into default and can't get worked out and the losses are even steeper and blah, 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 like on and on we go, right? Like that, that is going to exacerbate the cycle even more than it already did. I don't think... As of right now, I don't think this problem and this hole and the banks that are really screwed are big enough to have a massive effect because the big banks that matter a whole lot more are going to be just fine. And, you know, so again, my my takeaway from this as a bank investor would be very different from my takeaway as an equity market investor or a credit market investor or an American citizen, right? So like as a bank investor, one of my big takeaways is that deposit betas just went way up. Right. So deposits are now going to flow much more freely and be far less sticky than they were in the past. And so your cost of deposit funding just went way up, probably even if you're JP Morgan, because everybody's probably going to pull their heads out of the sand, like I said earlier, and say, wait a minute, why do I have this cash sitting in a demand account or you know, even in a relatively low yielding savings account or CD when I could park it over here in a money market fund or in T bills? Right. So like that it's just fascinating how stupid people were. And I, I hate to bag on somebody specifically, but again, Roku had to put out an 8K because they had a half a billion dollars sitting in cash at Silicon Valley Bank. Like that money's all like I I don't know who the CFO and treasurer are that were thought that was a good idea. They had just to hired a CFO, new CFO, two days before that happened. So it was their uh prior CFO who was on Where his way we- out. Where and, was the board um, and the CEO to say like this is a good yeah, he, use of our balance sheet? Like, like that's just their CFO stunning. is on the board of advisors to Silicon Valley Bank. So wow. if there's ever a conflict, you know. Wow. Yeah. But anyway, well, like so that's you, that stuff I yeah. think will really shake the tree for a lot of people to say, like, wait a minute, we shouldn't have all this money on deposit at these banks. It should go somewhere else. Now that could have unintended consequences, both good and bad in the rest of the economy, but the impact on the bank is very clear and their cost of funding just went way up and they're going to have to be a little more careful because they're going to get for sure more regulatory scrutiny to your point like not taps on the shoulder like you have to raise equity but like tap on the shoulder like hey guys like you know wake up we're here they're going to get way more negative attention and you would presume that any board with a pulse is going to be asking way tougher questions and being way more cautious and prudent about their funding mix going forward. And so by any state of the world, like it's hard to imagine bank earnings and bank returns on capital going up, right? I mean, that that's really difficult to foresee here. And one potential risk that I see to your point, which is the, the great question, like is always what happens next, right? Like what are the, the knock-on effects here and, and who could step in and fill this, right? You have a lot of private credit funds that have made a lot of loans over the past two, three, five years. And a lot of those loans were probably stupid. So some of those private credit funds could probably get into a lot of trouble. Again, I don't think that's a systemic issue. It's not something that would keep me up at night as like, you know, your average citizen or even your average investor, but like you could definitely see some blowups there. A little more real, which is totally, it's related, but in the sense, totally different are the credit unions. 
right? Because I don't think a lot of people realize how absolutely massive credit unions are and how important they are in a lot of communities, right? And most credit unions have kind of their own trade association and their own, um, I forget the acronym for the depository insurance agency that that handles that. It's basically the same thing as the FDIC, but the accounting is not quite as clear, at least to me. Uh, the, the disclosure is not quite as transparent. And I think a lot of these credit unions, because they are so lightly regulated, and they are just as concentrated, right? I mean, last time I checked, the largest financial institution in the state of Washington was the Boeing Credit Union, right? Like just crazy stuff like that where, and again, Boeing's not, Boeing employees hopefully aren't going to be as herd-like and lemming-like as the Silicon Valley crowd was, but you never know. Like, And so I just think like if we get a credit cycle or some sort of other knock-on economic shock, like the credit unions would be a place that I'd be worried about being a source of a source of pain. And then secondarily, I think going back to one of your original questions, I think we're probably going to be stuck in a world where, you know, just like the the implicit guarantee of Fannie and Freddie, like, oh, they're not really on the federal balance sheet, but like, yeah, we're definitely going to backstop the mortgage market. Like, you know, go ahead, Japan or whoever, like you can buy our agency paper, you know, as a sovereign entity you know outside our borders and like we're gonna we're gonna be there for you it's just as good as buying treasuries don't worry like i think you're probably gonna be in the same place with deposits right where like they never explicitly guarantee it but they've implicitly guaranteed it for at least 15 years now and i think they've probably kind of kind of made their bed in that sense and i don't think there's any getting out of it so let me ask you this question you said something as a bank investor right uh and i know you weren't saying you are a bank investor there but i'm curious you know, in this environment, are there, without naming names, like, is it worth being a dumpster diver looking for the baby thrown out with the bathwater? Or do you think banks are increasingly uninvestable? Sure. Well, no, I, look, I think everybody has to decide what they understand and what they don't understand, right? So like, I've had enough experience in energy and oil and gas companies to know that it's just not my wheelhouse my hat's off to everybody who wants to do it. Like it's not uninvestable. It's just uninvestable for me. So I find all the people that like issue these public fatwas like, oh, see, I told you like Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse prove that like all banks are uninvestable. Like that's ridiculous and stupid. So that's clearly not true. I happen to spend enough time in banks and financial institutions and I happen to just find it interesting. So they're not uninvestable for me, but it is difficult. Um, And so you have to know what you're doing. There's no getting around that. I don't happen to own any at the moment. One reason, so going back, I mentioned this a little bit earlier and and I'll reiterate again, by the way, this is 100% no financial advice of any kind, no investment advice of any kind. Uh, You know, the part of the reason why I don't like doing that in a public forum is I don't want to get anybody else in a compromised position, have them lose money because they listen to me. Like it's way better if you do your own thinking and your own homework on this, but it can be good to look back at, prior situations and take the lessons for what they're worth. So anyway, I owned Schwab for several years. I think Schwab's a quality institution. I think Schwab generally does things more good than bad. But I had, and obviously I had no idea what was going to happen as the fallout from COVID and zero interest rates. But when I owned Schwab and COVID hit in 2020 and April, May, June, I don't remember when I exactly sold it. It was sometime in the second, third quarter of 2020. The main reason I sold it was I was like, these deposits and money are just flowing into this business and they can't do anything with it. Like, where are they going to put all this money? And it turns out that they did park a ton of money into paper yielding one and a half percent. Thankfully, they've only taken about, uh, at the time, I don't remember what the duration was, but I just looked the other day and the duration on that book now is about three years. Nowhere near as painful as Silicon Valley's duration, which was like over six, I think. Um, And they're held a maturity portfolio. But I just remember thinking like, all right, you know, Schwab's going through this very transformative merger with TD Ameritrade. They've got all this money flowing in and nowhere to put it. Like, this is just going to be really tough. And there's a high likelihood that they're going to make more or make less money rather than more money relative to what I was expecting and relative to the valuation that I kind of demanded. And then I look like a total moron for the next two years when the stock like doubled and I was totally wrong. And at least on that basis. And so again, I, I didn't, I wasn't correct then. I'm not saying I'm correct now. I don't own Schwab now. I'm not making any recommendations on Schwab now. But like, just like it's completely insane uh, 
to directly compare 2008 to today. It's completely insane to compare a bank like Silicon Valley to a financial institution like Schwab. Like, yes, Schwab has a bank, but it's a totally different kettle of fish. And if you're if you're getting your hot takes from like Twitter and CNBC and thinking that that informs your decisions on Schwab, like you're a total moron and you deserve to lose money and just stop. Like that's just a disaster. So, um, but yeah, look, I, in terms of what to do more broadly, like, yeah, I, I think it always makes sense to go bargain hunting. The question becomes with any bank or financial institution and in any situation you described as dumpster diving, which I like to do too, like it can be awesome when you find something that's really cheap and beaten up for no reason. You've just got to go double, triple, quadruple check your homework and make sure that there's really no reason. Because the problem with any of these things, right? I mean, we just saw this with Silicon Valley Bank two weeks ago. I would not have dreamed that they would see $42 billion of deposit outflows in one day. And as an outsider, there's no legal way to know that they're having $42 billion of deposits in one day. And what the public markets do is they look at, oh my God, look at the traffic on Twitter. Look at these Slack channels blowing up. Look at the physical lines out the door to get into a Silicon Valley bank to wire out your deposits and they freak out and it's game over. And so it's really difficult in these situations that are moving at hyper speed to figure out what's happening and and separate the noise and the signal. So I would just encourage people to be thoughtful and be careful, but I'm always going to be the type going looking for a bargain and going looking for somebody that's being painted with too broad a brush, baby thrown out with the bathwater, you know, whatever cliche you want to use. I mean, that that's always a good idea for me. Yeah. Yeah. I feel very similarly, you know, and it's funny. I own Schwab probably overlapping uh, just about the entire period with you sold it at the same juncture with my rationale being, I don't want to fight Zerp again. Like, I had bought it toward the tail end of that on this thesis that, you know, okay, it's got a nice tailwind behind that. And I know the company well and right. yada, yada. But once it was Zerp again, it was like, who knows how long this will last for, what the consequences will be. I, I don't really want to be in any bank or bank like uh, thing for the time being. And then, you know, last year you'd heard a lot of people saying, something along the lines of, oh, finally, we got real uh, interest rates again. Banks are going to start making a lot of money. Um, and I think there was a lot of like laziness behind some of the investors that had flocked to banks in the last year, year plus, um, that now, you know, you pay a price for that sort of um, behavior. Right. And I do think some of these things like maybe if you were to dumpster dive, I'll throw out a couple things, but 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 maybe a couple things to look for that might be helpful uh, would, would be good for us to discuss. You know, banks that did not grow their assets super fast, banks that spoke honestly about the question of do I defend earnings or do I, um, you know, act with prudence and defend my balance sheet here. I think um, you could find some pretty good cases of that. Now, it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to act it. So you definitely have to verify um, what what you're looking at. But, you know, I think those are two of the more important things to look for in a bank right now. And it does seem like, in many cases, the bigger question is not so much, will this bank survive? You know, there's certainly some cases where the question is, is, is about uh, life or death for a bank. But more rather like what's the true earnings power of this bank right now and for the next handful of years given their commitments given the decisions made these past few years um and so that's a really different question to try to tackle and we have the tools to do do as much yep no i i agree and i guess one other parting piece of advice i'd give for anyone who's you know looking at banks whether they're new or old season pros at it is like you just can't forget the fact that management really, really, really matters in a bank or a financial institution of any kind, right? Because of the inherent leverage, mistakes and and good decisions are both magnified significantly in both directions. And so I don't, I think it was Buffett, but I maybe it just sounds like Buffett would have said, and I'm misattributing it to him. But the, the old famous line is that there are way more banks than there are bankers, right? Which was another huge red flag. Like the second thing I did after looking at Silicon Valley's balance sheet was I went and looked at management and I went and looked at the board of directors. And like I said, you know, it's kind of hard to argue that marketing 
wasn't the primary function of the organization. And like they were notorious. That's how I originally came across them. It was like they back was when I was at a hedge fund that did uh, converts and lots of other things like Silicon Valley Bank was famous for, you know, they they were pretty good on the lending side, actually. And then they'd take warrants and they'd get some amazing paydays out of these warrants that they owned in these small startups and, and tech companies and whatever. And that's, by the way, what's part of what's making it hard to sell the, the portfolio is that they have some stuff that's not traditional bank and bank balance sheet stuff, but it's neither here nor there. I'm sure it'll get figured out eventually. But like they were notorious for just being like a marketing first organization. And I, you know, there was an article that somebody posted. It was actually a venture capitalist posted it and said like, look, this is what Silicon Valley was doing for the community. This was so brilliant. And it was a story about how some guy was like, you know, in his late twenties or early thirties and he'd gotten funded, his company had gotten funded by venture capital. Venture capital told him to set up an account at Silicon Valley Bank. So he had both the business account at Silicon Valley Bank and opened a personal account at Silicon Valley Bank. And he needed to buy a home to live in the area, whereas it was somewhere around physical Silicon Valley in California. And he's like, I walked into Silicon Valley Bank with my like, you know, my Patagonia logo vest and no credit history and no W-2 income and no assets to speak of. And no bank would give me a mortgage. And I walk into Silicon Valley Bank and they're like, here you go. Here's a fixed rate mortgage at two and a half. (laughs) Okay, no, that's not a good thing, right? Like that's not speaking to like the diligence and quality of the relationship there. Because again, like as soon as the the three decision makers at the VC firm shut down your firm or your company where they pull the account, like this, this ongoing relationship doesn't necessarily have any value, but because it worked so well for a number of years and it worked, super well for the past three or five years like they just didn't care anymore and like they would put on these amazing marketing shindigs and you know sponsor the the wine newsletter and all this other stuff and it had nothing to do with running a bank like if you are going to invest in the junior securities of a bank you've got to read the documents and you've got to read the people and you've got to consider risk as like a primary function of what they're doing or else it's going to end badly sooner or later Really well said there. Really well said. Hey, can't can't really uh, add will, anything to that. Well, one other thing I do want to add that's fascinating, coded to this whole thing. You asked about Credit Suisse. I want John to chime in on this, but I I do view it as like Credit Suisse has had so many problems for so many years. You could argue like so many decades that like no one doesn't really have anything to do with the other beyond the fact that like. It's actually a fact in in plate tectonics that if you get an earthquake on one section of a fault, you're more likely to get an earthquake on a different (laughs) section of the fault or even on an adjoining fault, right? And so that would be the analogy that I would make here. And I find it completely fascinating. I didn't realize that some of these AT1 bonds that are contingible, convertible securities, COCOs, like they're explicitly ranked below the equity. And like, if you had taken the five minutes to go read the prospectus or read the fixed income presentation on the Credit Suisse Investor Relations website, you would see very clearly the waterfall that shows that these these you know bonds that most people would consider a convertible preferred and in normal world that ranks above the equity they very clearly rank below the equity and yet here we are with billions and billions of dollars you know just like the silicon valley folks didn't do the most basic due diligence on their major counterparty these brilliant investors that put billions of dollars into these AT1 bonds in in Credit Suisse thought they had a claim above the equity and they very clearly didn't. And now they're all crying foul to the Swiss regulators and saying like, we got screwed. And it's like, no, no, you just didn't do your job. Yeah, I'd agree with you on that, Phil. I think, you know, Credit Suisse has been a disaster in the making for quite some time. I think the the CDS play has been around for quite a oh, bit yeah. longer than uh you know the the kind of the the US earthquake that we've experienced uh just recently so you know um i mean these institutions are so levered right that if they're then badly managed and credit suisse has basically been involved in every major scandal you can think of um yep. you know um in recent years so, um, you know, that's enough to kind of uh, wipe out the equity if you were to actually go through and, uh, and you know, mark the, the assets uh, what they are. And yeah, the bank just, um, people lost faith in it and I think um, basically had to go under. 
you know, Switzerland, obviously, for systemic reasons, can't just let it um, totally, um, you know, implode. So that's why, um, you know, you have this gunshot marriage uh, with UBS. So we'll see how that turns out. But maybe just a couple of comments uh, from me here as we as we wrap it up. Um, you know, what's interesting with Silicon Valley Bank and also First Republic is they have been viewed as as kind of unique franchises, like bank that actually have franchise value and should not be valued on book value. Um, and and if you think about it, you know, this supposed positive that they had these um, high net worth clients and whatnot turned out to be a huge, huge negative. I mean, these these depositors were total snakes. And especially with Silicon Valley Bank, where everybody has been saying they're so um, instrumental to the Silicon Valley uh, ecosystem and they're beloved by the VCs and the portfolio companies. And then they just get stabbed in the back at such a time. I mean, it yep. literally, you know, one day, um, you know, and why did the deal not get priced that night? Probably the word was already out that, you know, like there wasn't a deposit number to to hang on to. So how do you price a deal if you think literally the next morning, like so much of the deposit base will be out the door? I mean, I don't know. I'm just speculating, but I think the cat was kind of out of the bag and, and nobody dared put a price on that offering anymore or people got cold feet. Well, um, you maybe. know. And, the stock was still at a hundred bucks a share. <laughs> there had to be some price, right? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but you know, uh, I'm thinking of of that kind of a situation and that kind of a deposit base compared to, let's say, another bank that's been a total disaster in terms of execution. Um, you guys may know of Metro Bank in the UK. Uh, which was also oh, kind yeah. of a, a, a darling, had a growth phase and so forth, and totally um, ran afoul of regulators and just a, a whole bunch of missed stumbles. Um, and, and as that bank, as the stock price basically imploded like 95 plus percent, deposits basically did not budge. And Metro Bank is now on the way to recovery. They literally, you know, I've been following it throughout this whole saga that they had. The deposit base did not go down by more than a couple of percent throughout this whole period. And that's mm. the difference in what kind of depositors you have. You know, are those depositors like Silicon Valley Bank that are going to be so plugged in that they can literally trigger a bank run in a matter of hours? Or are your depositors people who, really never even check what the stock price of the bank is or what the heck is going on with their business right. news, right? Um, you know, another thing that it's just I'll just kind of throw out there that I've always marveled about, and I think this is a real difference between the US and Europe. Um, as far as I know, in Europe, um, if you have a, a long-term fixed-rate mortgage, and interest rates go down, you can't just go refinance that. You know, you're kind of stuck with that higher interest rate. And in the US, basically, the consumer gets all the benefit. If rates go down, you go and refi. If rates go up, right. you keep your uh, mortgage as it is. So the banks are taking a huge risk in the US on the kind of um, long term curve without the benefit, you know, of when rates go down because people just refi. Yeah, that's a big reason why they allow the implicit Fannie and Freddie guarantee to just continue, right? Is it's 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 nationalizing the credit nationalizing the risk so that the cost of capital stays artificially low on a 30-year rate mortgage. Cause you're right, there's not another country in the world with a 30-year fixed rate mortgage market like the US has. Yeah. And and maybe I'll just, you know, lastly weigh in on this deposit insurance thing. Um I mean, no, no deposits have been impaired so far with any of these bank blowups in the last couple of weeks, right? Well, no. And one one thing I should have said about that going back is like I did go back and read. There's some really good academic studies of the cost to resolve banks when they fail. It generally shakes out to like 30% of assets, uh, which is a big deal, right? And the deposit fund has been more than enough to... 
to secure. I mean, they've always paid off like within two days, any insured deposits and almost always the uninsured deposits get all of their money back too. You take some liquidity risk for sure. And if, you know, if God forbid you're in some situation where you have way too much of your money tied up in uninsured deposits, you do have a short-term problem there. But I would argue that if you raise the deposit limit to, and I'll just pick a number, let's say a million dollars. And again, so you're you're a small business where you need that million dollars for working capital. You're fully protected on the basis of the FDIC insurance, and that's never going to be in question. They've never had a loss. There's no reason to think they'll ever have a loss if that continues to be run the same way. And if you're above a million dollars in cash balances that you need, you just simply need a CFO and a treasurer who can handle your cash management needs. And that's why the money market exists. Money market funds exist. That's why the T-bill market exists, right? Like there are other ways to handle this. And I think if you go to a blanket deposit guarantee for all deposits of unlimited size, you're going to bring in all sorts of unintended consequences. And yes, look, the moral hazard argument of people should be paying attention to where their deposits sit and, insta- you know, and bringing a little bit of uh, discipline to the market is a valid argument, even though it failed here. I just think that whatever benefits you have would be completely blown away if you go to a blanket deposit guarantee of all sizes and it would bring in all sorts of risks that would not be commensurate with any sort of benefit because there's none. Yeah, I guess my my only point there is that um, if we de facto do have unlimited deposit protection, which so far in this crisis, it seems like we've had. I don't think there's any size deposit that got impaired. No, no um, not in these failures. No, you're yeah, right, because they've, they've stepped in. Yeah, and, and, and they y- stepped in to, to create the bridge to like getting your money out now, right? So you don't even have to wait for it. Because originally, the way it would work is, and in a really big receivership like this, you'd get a receiver certificate. So if you had 250000 on deposit and you had another million above that, you'd get a certificate for the million. And in big in big receiverships, you'd get a a secondary market for that kind of thing, right? Which is the way that you'd hope for this to go. Because if you say, all right, I have a million dollars on deposit. I don't care if it takes a couple of years to get that back. I'm willing to take the time value of money hit. I'm just going to sit tight. Some hedge fund comes along and says, I'll bid you 70, I'll bid you 80, I'll bid you 90 on that today. And you need the money. Great. Off you go. You don't have to have any sort of messy government guarantee to resolve that, right? Yeah. And I mean, in this case, uh, you know, Silicon Valley Bank really is a poster child for doing things the wrong way. And as you said, Phil, it's not the kind of systemic thing we had in 2008. Um, So, you know, I can definitely sympathize with the argument that if you're going to protect all deposits at Silicon Valley Bank, you got to do the same for some regional bank in Missouri or wherever. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's, that's where it becomes tough. a problem. Exactly. It's, like, yeah, it's other, just otherwise, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you're ba- you're basically bailing out a bunch of VCs just because they got pulled. You know, but that's that, what that's, this is the problem. Though, it goes like. all the way. It goes all the way back to IndyMac, right? In 2007, like people don't seem to really realize, like that was a de facto uninsured deposit bailout on the same terms, and here we are. You know, 16 years later, we're doing the same thing over again. So like, I just, I wouldn't want to bet on anything changing in that regard. I just do think it would be a mistake to rewrite the FDIC. You know, I think it would take an act of Congress actually to extend that, but um, I I don't think it would be a good idea to extend that on an unlimited basis for the foreseeable, you know, forever, basically to say that all deposits are guaranteed. It's just, yeah, yeah, there's no easy answer. And again, I am sympathetic to the argument that had had a bank of Silicon Valley's size uh, gone illiquid in terms of its uninsured deposits for months and months, that they would have had a problem, like it would have been a problem, and there would have been further deposit flight because of that problem. But like in terms of like where the snowball stops rolling downhill, like I think that's a decline that the broader economy could have managed. Right. Like I that that's how they got around this, right? Is they actually came out and declared both Signature and Silicon Valley Bank to be systemically important, whereas previously they were well below that asset test. Yeah, and they're not systemically important. I mean the, I think it's a tough argument. Yeah. You know, here the regulators could have easily said, you know, we're gonna these banks took huge risks. We're not gonna intervene, but we're gonna temporarily protect all deposits at other banks but right you know maybe because you know one 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 kind of small storyline i don't know if you guys caught that was that um some european regulators were really pissed at 
what the what the um, the Fed did here, um, because the kind of the the U.S. regulators had have been lecturing the Europeans for years yeah. that they shouldn't do anything like this if if it got to that, and now they did the exact opposite. Um, so I guess my point is, if we are going to have this de facto deposit uh, protection, then the banks should be paying higher insurance premia, um, you know, to account for that. Otherwise, you are yeah. effectively... They did say that yeah. any losses realized by the FDIC would be paid for via such a fee. Right. And that's always been true. And look, that's that's true as well. Like the, the deposit insurance premiums are probably going up for all sorts of reasons, right? So... Yeah, here we are. And and you know, you're kind of doing this after the fact, which it's not really how insurance is supposed to work. Um, you know, yeah. where basically yeah. I think, you know, you had some uh senator kind of point out like if if these if all banks are now going to have to pay uh increased um premia into the fund to to kind of make up for these losses, they're basically right. subsidizing the Silicon Valley Bank um right. depositors. So yeah. Anyway, let's but let's it's, leave it's, it there. Yeah, it's tough because that's that's where I said earlier. Like, what what would you have done two years ago to avoid getting to this outcome? Right. Like, if you had omnipotence and omniscience and could say, "I know exactly what's coming, and I can do whatever I want to fix it." Like, it's a tough problem to solve. So that's where my sympathies somewhat are with the regulators. Like, this was not an easy one to get out from under in advance, right? Because it was two things that are not normal that hadn't happened in the past that don't have easy answers, right? The combination of zero interest rates and COVID at the same time, combined with this massive boom of liquidity and speculation and craziness coming into the market, right? Like that's not a mix I would worse, I would wish on my worst enemy, let alone a benevolent regulator. So it's a tough one. It really is. Yep, absolutely. Elliot, any last words? No, I think this was a great episode. I think I learned a lot just sitting here uh, talking with you all and, um, you know, I think uh, we'll definitely have more to say on this topic over time. Yeah, God only knows what's going to happen in the next week or two, right? So maybe we'll be revisiting this sooner than <laughs> I think. I mean, it's it seems like uh, the years go by, the, the, the months go by in years, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Hey, we're sticking to the this week moniker. So we're definitely speaking about timely stuff. All right, I think that's appropriate, yeah. <laughs> Great. And well, some timeless in there. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys, and thank you all for listening. Goodbye for now. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.